Lord reigns, let the nations tremble. He sits enthroned between the cherubim, let the earth shake. Great is the Lord in Zion. He is exalted over all the nations. Let them praise your great and awesome name. He is holy. Father in heaven, we come to you through our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your mercies of love to us. We pray that as we gather before you this morning, that your spirit would bless us. We pray that you would show us the glory of Christ our Savior and strengthen us that we might live before him in our world today. We ask for your blessing on us in Jesus' name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please remain standing and grateful to your service. We're singing hymn number 16, Come Let Us Sing Unto the Lord, hymn number 16.
Let's remain standing and we'll recite the Apostles' Creed together. Congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, the life everlasting. Of the creation, 
We can also describe him as transcendent over all things. He does not need his creation in any way. He did not create because of a lack of fellowship in him or any need for glory from creatures. Uh, there is no need on God's part for the creation. He eternally existed as blessed forevermore. And so there was no need or sense for a, a creation to, in some way, complete God or fulfill his purposes or anything like that. God is full of blessedness. He is most absolute. He is most free. And uh, he is not in any way dependent upon his creation. So we, we have here the, the transcendent God who stands above and beyond his creation. This is important for us to hear today when you listen to some preaching which seems to make God dependent upon the fellowship of his creatures. God, the typical image is taken from the book of Revelation, Jesus stands at the door and knocks and he waits for you to respond to him. And this is the offer as it were of salvation. And so Jesus is something of a gentleman, and he's patient and waiting. God is in heaven, almost as if we're wringing his hands, wondering what you're going to do. This is a misinterpretation of that uh, image in Revelation, where it's not Jesus uh, knocking on the door of the unbelieving part. It's Jesus knocking on the door of the church, on those within the church who are not living in communion with Christ. And he's seeking renewed fellowship with them. God does not just hope and, and pray that some will come and hear the gospel and respond to him because he so desires their fellowship. God is entirely independent of his creation and not in any way uh, requiring fellowship with us for his own sense of fulfillment or satisfaction. And so the confession notes that he is alone in and unto himself all sufficient. One of our uh, great theologians in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, Cornelius Van Til, uh, talked about God as the self-contained God. Now, that's not an immediately apparent description of God for us. It doesn't come from scriptures. But what Dr. Van Til tried to say is that God has everything that he needs within himself. He has all life and blessedness within himself. He is his own uh, uh, completion. And so that is especially true by virtue of the fact that God is not a single person, as you have in Judaism or in Islam, where there would be perhaps an interest in fellowship or a sense of uh, fulfillment in the creation of things. No, the Christian God is a triune God with three persons, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. They fully satisfy each other for all needs of love, fellowship, communion, and so forth. So God is self-contained and not dependent upon his creatures in any way. He manifests his glory to them, by, unto, and upon them. And so as God creates the heavens and the earth, the purpose is not for our, so much for our enjoyment, fulfillment, what have you, it's for his own glory, that he would be magnified by what he has done. And so in his work of creation, he creates the heavens and the earth, he allows sin and entrance into the world, he allows the wicked to flourish in the world, and even the wicked will serve the purposes of God and bring glory to Him. They will magnify His justice, His righteousness. Whereas the, the saints, those who are the elect of God, who are joined to Christ and redeemed, uh, they will magnify the great love of God, the compassion, the goodness of God. And so in these different ways, the different aspects of the character of God are revealed and manifested glorified. Indeed, the wicked even show the goodness of God in that he is patient with the wicked every day as he brings the sunshine, the rain, and all fruitful seasons to them. God is good. So God manifests his glory in all things. And furthermore, he is sovereign over them to do by them, for them, or upon them whatsoever himself pleases. 
This is an idea which is very hard for the modern man to accept, that God is sovereign over all, that he rules our lives and accomplishes his perfect purpose in every aspect of life. There are things about the sovereignty of God, of course, that are beyond our understanding. God is mysterious to us in different ways, and that is to be expected. He is transcendent, he is infinite, he is all-wise and all-knowing. He has not been pleased to reveal everything to us. We could not even comprehend all these things. God is God, and so we uh, depend upon Him for uh, guidance in the course of life. But He remains sovereign over all, and so it's His good pleasure in the end to cast the wicked into hell, to save the elect and bring them into heaven. It could have been God's good pleasure to cast all mankind into hell with their sin. He was not under any obligation to save any one of us. He would have been perfectly just and right to condemn us in Adam for our sin and to judge us accordingly. But to show forth his mercy and grace, he freely chose some out of all of humanity to be his own elect, his chosen ones, his bride, his children. And so he sent his son to redeem them from their sins and bring them to himself. This reveals the sovereignty of God in salvation. God initiates the work of salvation. He chooses whom he will reveal himself to, and he sovereignly works in their lives such that they finally will come to him and receive the full uh, salvation for which they have been purchased. So God is sovereign in all these things, and therefore he is to be praised and glorified throughout all eternity as we have occasion to explore the sovereignty of God, his justice, and his goodness, his great power uh, throughout all of eternity. We will praise him forever and ever for these things. Our hearts will be illumined to the truth of these things, and what is more, uh, we will rejoice in God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and delight in him and his steadfast love. This time we'll turn to our scripture readings, and I've changed the service a bit. I'll just read them if that's okay. Our first reading is from Psalm 145. These scriptures are designed to complement the sermon and the uh, text uh, this morning. It may take you a moment to kind of make the connections here, but I hope you'll be able to begin to see a theme developing. Psalm 145, we'll begin with verse 10 read through the end of the chapter. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power, to make known to the children of man your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. The Lord is faithful in all his words and kind in all his works. The Lord upholds all who are failing and raises up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you, and you give them their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the desire of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord, and that all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. Next in the Gospels, we'll look at the Gospel of Mark, chapter 6, beginning in verse 30. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him, 
all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, Come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them. And they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, This is a desolate place, and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, You give them something to eat. They said to him, Shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give it to them to eat? He said to them, How many loaves do you have? Go and see. And when they had found out, they said, Five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups, by hundreds and by fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing, and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up twelve baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. Those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. Finally, we'll look at Philippians chapter 4. I'll read for you verses 4 through 7. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this reading of your word and for the description it gives of your loving kindness and your faithfulness to your people. We thank you that when we are in distress, when we feel uh, our sense of need, uh, we thank you that you are pleased to minister to us, to lift us up, to help us along the way, to feed us out of your bounty. We do thank you for your provision and care for us uh, over the weeks and years that we've been before you. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that we have from you day after day. We thank you, O Lord, for the blessing of your word and the ministry of the gospel here. We do pray that your blessing would continue to be on that. We pray, Lord, that you would lift us up in faith and strengthen us to be mature in Christ, growing in Him. We thank you, Lord, for uh, this uh, reading of your word. We do pray that you would Teach us to love you and to place our trust in you and to rejoice in all things. Father, we lift up our request to you in prayer and know that you love and care for us. And so we do pray that you have mercy on, on your church. We thank this morning of our friends in Leon, Kentucky, uh, our Orthodox Presbyterian Church there. We thank you for Pastor Jay Bennett and his family. We thank you for protecting them them from the floodwaters as they were in their second floor apartment and saw the floodwaters coming through. We do pray, Lord, as the storefront uh, property beneath them, where they uh, lead your congregation there, uh, that as it has been uh, damaged and perhaps uh, destroyed, we do pray that you would be pleased to bring help to them uh, in recovering from the flood. We pray that those across the country who arrive there to assist them and to 
help to rebuild things there that would be protected and blessed. And we thank you for the way in which your church reaches out to those who are in need in different places. And we do pray for deacons and those who assist them in their efforts. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on these efforts. We do pray for Tamara Hamill as she recovers from her surgery. We do pray, Lord, that you would bring her relief and help. We pray, Lord, we thank you for her safety in uh, the surgery, and uh, we do pray that you would uh, watch over her and uh, bring her home safely. We pray for Melissa as she continues to recover from COVID-19. We thank you that she's doing well, and we pray, Lord, that you would bring her relief uh, from this call. Persisting we pray as well for her daughter Annabelle who was in an accident on Friday night. We thank you for protecting her from serious harm. We do pray, Lord, that you would be pleased to grant her healing and renew health and strength. We thank you for her and her brother and commit them to your love and care. Father, I pray that you be with Katya and protect her in Ukraine. Thank you for your care and provision for her. I pray that you keep her safe. Pray that you would open a way for her to come here. Thank you for providing Tim with a new job. We thank you, Lord, that that came about rather quickly. We do pray that you bless him in this new uh, form of employment. We pray that you provide for him and for his needs and give him joy in his labors. Father, we pray that you would uh, be with our elderly, minister to their earthly needs, comfort and strengthen them. And we pray, Lord, that you would protect them from harm. One, 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 one. Dad, please be quiet. Please be quiet. Father, we do pray that you would uh, minister to us as we attend to your word. We pray that your blessing would be on our fellowship together, and that you would teach us to pray, even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Hymn 509 is our next hymn, Jesus, Lover of My Soul. 509.
chapter 22. Plan to finish up the chapters. We're going to pick up our reading at verse 16. I'll read through the end. If a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make her his wife. If her father utterly refuses to give her to him, he shall pay money equal to the bride price for virgins. You shall not permit a sorceress to live. Whoever lies with an animal shall be put to death. Whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. You shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, for you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them, and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with the sword, and your wives shall become widows, and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people, with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. You shall not exact interest from him. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down. For that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body. And in what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. You shall not revile God, or curse a ruler of your people. You shall not delay to offer from the fullness of your harvest, and from the outflow of your presses. The firstborn of your sons you shall give to me. You shall do the same with your oxen and with your sheep. Seven days it shall be with this mother. On the eighth day you shall give it to me. You shall be consecrated to me. Therefore you shall not eat any flesh that is torn by beasts in the field. You shall throw it to the dogs. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your law. We thank you for its righteousness, its compassion, uh, and the way that it points us to Christ. We pray that your spirit would bless us as we meditate on that this morning. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was getting in my car this morning to come over to the church. I heard this loud screeching side of the house. I looked and here there was a hawk being attacked by a crow. And the crow was going after it. They were tossing about and got away. I guess the screeching was because somebody was getting hit. And it, it struck me that God so orders his world, his universe, that those who are predators also can be prey. There's a sense in which in God's order, Everyone is accountable to somebody else. Nobody gets off scot-free. Nobody's free to do as they please. Even the predator, the mighty hawk that soars up above and floats around on the winds, spying out his prey, nonetheless can be attacked by crows. There is a sense of justice in this world that even manifests itself in the animal world, as difficult as that might be. We have in our text here a continued enumeration of God's laws and how they apply to Jewish society at that time. We must remember that this is a unique situation in that you have a civil society organized by God that is God's kingdom with his people national Israel. And so he rules over them as king. It is a different situation from what we have today. The church goes out into the world, goes into, if you will, hostile territory. 
where there was paganism, all kinds of false worship, and so forth. We preached the gospel of different communities, bringing them to a saving knowledge of Christ, and establishing the kingdom of God in the midst of the kingdoms of this world. Not everything that we read in the law of Moses carries forward immediately and directly into our contemporary situation. We made the note that there is a general equity of law, however, that does transfer into this modern age. So we're going to take a look at some things here this morning, particularly the issues where the death penalty is given. We'll consider them in their context. But what I want to do here this morning is first identify God's justice and verify that the, that the laws that God puts in place here are righteous altogether. I think many today take a look at these laws and they wonder about that. They question the justice of these things. We'll, we'll consider that for a moment. Second, I want to consider the compassionate nature of God's law. It's not designed to crush people. It's designed to protect people. And we'll see that as we work through this text here this morning. And finally, I want to show how God's law is a law which brings us into a relationship with God. And there's no part of God's law that is so secular that God is not engaged or involved in that. Our understanding of law is different from what you might find in secular society, where law is simply which is arranged at with people who vote on different things. And this is going to be our laws, and we will govern ourselves, and any offense here only has to do with our horizontal relationships. What we find here is that in God's law, He Himself interacts with His people. He judges. He becomes engaged with us. And what is more, He requires our devotion to Him. So let's first take a look at the justice of God's law. And we've tried to make this note as we've gone through the text here in different ways. Uh, and to try to answer objections as we uh, uh, make our way along. For example, a few weeks back we talked about slavery. And we talked about how God has so arranged slavery under Jewish society that it actually works to the benefit of those who are enslaved for a period of time. Because, as I can hold the tape back, uh, because people may because of their sin, their laziness, uh, stealing, criminal activity of one sort or another, they get sold into slavery, but there's a limit to it. We need to avoid taking the, the slavery in the Jewish society and, and the way God described it, and just say that that's the same thing as what we had in our American experience. That was something that was different. That was lawless, and that was right to be opposed. American slavery was based on kidnapping, stealing. In God's law, the kidnapper and those who had the slaves could be executed, should be executed. It's a completely different system. The temptation for us today is to read the Jewish system in light of our experience and therefore say, well, slavery all slavery is bad. I don't think so. Furthermore, you find that this slavery was, in some ways, in view of the, the corruption of people and is designed to restrain wickedness and promote righteousness. And so a slave who became a slave because of uh, reckless spending, uh, stealing, uh, laziness, whatever, he gets into the slavery situation where he learns a trade, builds disciplines, uh, becomes productive in society. That's the goal of it, to make someone who's unproductive, productive. So there was a compassionate direction to it. And furthermore, unlike American slavery, it wasn't unending, where, where you were completely the slave of, of the master for as long as you live. There was a limit to it. Six years, and then you were set free. Indeed, you were allowed to be, or the, the slave owner would equip you for success in life. Much different. Much different from what we had in our current experience. 
I'll suggest further with regard to the penal code today, when you take somebody and put them in a prison, is that better than the Jewish slavery system? It seems to me that you've got slaves there in prisons where they're kept under lock and key like animals and stored there, warehouse, until such a time as supposedly the punishment has worked its way through the system. We would be much better if we return to a biblical system, a, a, a biblical penal code, where people are required to restore that which they take and pay it back. If they can't pay it back, then they become indentured servants for a period of time by which they're late, where they pay off that which they've stolen or, or that which they know. A lot of college students in indentured situations. College. I'm uh, continuing. So there is justice to the system. And similarly here, we find justice coming, but in ways that we don't expect that are outside of our kind of experience and we get a little bit concerned about. The one thing it is somewhat akin to our experience. You have those are saying that you shall not allow the sorcerer or sorcerers to live. Now first, pay attention to the language here. They shall not be allowed to live. There is a certain measure of um, wrath, anger, and complete uh, giving over this person to death. In, in other statements, when we go to the, the murder laws, if you commit murder, uh, then you shall be put to death. That was a law. And so the murderer would be judged and, and them to death. Here, you shall not permit them to live. And, and the language is such that it, it, it seems to be stressing more than just the, the corporal side of the death penalty, capital punishment. There is a spiritual side to this as well. Cast them into hell. They are such an abomination to God that they must not be allowed to live. They must be cast out of God's kingdom. Cast into hell. So the sorcerer who consults the occult, who makes use of dark forces to attempt to bring hardship and trouble to others around them and to rebel against God and his law order in the world today, the sorcerer must be driven out of Israel. Now, we look at that today in our modern American context and we go back to the sale of witch trials. And we think of the, the, the children of the pastor there, Paris, and, and he had two daughters and a niece who were in, involved in these uh, accusations, and they themselves had come under uh, unusual uh, events there, uh, and they learned these things from uh, a slave for the pastor, who was from um, the Caribbean, I believe. In any case, we tend to look at that and say, this is how we should read this requirement here in uh, Exodus, and so therefore, you've got to be careful about going in, into this direction. In this age in which we're living, yes, the church does not execute anyone. We drive people out of the church in excommunication. That's the discipline of the church, but we don't have the power of the sword. And one can argue that these kinds of crimes that we're going to consider here are things which uh, are, are not a part of the present day uh, system of justice. They can be, but the, the capital punishment against murder goes back beyond the Mosaic Law Code to uh, Noah, when Noah stepped off the ark. And God said, if anyone takes another man's life by man, shall his blood be shed. And so God established capital punishment right then and there, well before Moses and the Ten Commandments and the laws of God. So this was a standard that was to apply to all men and nations. The murderer must forfeit his life. But these kinds of requirements are part of the Mosaic system, the state laws of Israel, 
which collapsed at the end of that economy. Now, I think it, it would be up to the civil authority to decide what they want to do with these kinds of things. I would think, to my mind, they are just. Uh, God's law is always just. But uh, we have to see the great evil that's at work here. And, and the other thing to bear in mind is that when God sends capital punishment, yes, it's severe. But we have to remember that in God's justice, we are all subject to the wrath. We are all worthy of death because of our sin. God could punish all of us all at once. But he's pleased to spare us and allow history to continue. But for the sake of protecting Israel from this uh, evil influence in its midst, the sorcerer must be driven out. Same thing with regard to the one who is engaged in bestiality. You think, oh, gross, yeah. But what you have here was more than just bestiality. It was part of the pagan religious rituals of the time where you had sex with the gods that were symbolized by the animals. And so it was more than just the perversion of the sex. It was also uh, idolatry and wickedness. And so that person also was to be put to death. And finally, you have, after the sorcerer and, and the idolater here, you have one who sacrifices to a false god. And this too was to defy God and his rule over us and to pursue another god. This idolatry needed to be stopped so that Israel would not fall under wrath and judgment. When that idolatry was permitted in Israel, he eventually brought great judgments on the whole nation. As you see, Babylonians come in, the Assyrians, and so forth. God's laws are just, and they punish us for our sin. And God's laws are designed to protect the innocent. By stopping the witch, by driving them out of the community, you protect the church, you protect uh, many people from getting involved in the occult. Surely that's perfect drive that person out of the community. But God's laws are just, and then second, we see the compassion of God's law at work as well. First, uh, the text begins with the situation where uh, a, a young man seduces a, a young woman. In other words, they have a, a sexual relationship before marriage. This is not a situation of adultery. Uh, this is not a situation of rape. It's much like what we have today where young people are living together and uh, before the benefit of marriage uh, or just shacking up as some of the languages or they talk about one night stands and this sort of thing. Uh, this kind of thing is what comes into view here. And the law is designed to protect the young woman. And what happens is if now, this is a consensual relationship. The young man, it doesn't have to be a young man, but the, the, the man has a relationship with the young woman. Uh, they both go into it, and now the, the penalty for that is that he is obligated to give the bride price, which is a sum of money determined by the father and by the courts of the day. A, a bride price was given to the father to hold on behalf of the daughter, and the, the man must marry the woman. So, this is designed to protect the young woman because after she has lost her virginity in this relationship, in that society that would be a, a bad thing, and people would consider that she is, to use the vernacular, she's damaged goods, uh, she's not faithful, and what have you, and so it might be more difficult for her to find a marriage in the future because of that relationship. So therefore, to protect her, the one who engaged in this must give her the bride price and must marry her. Now, there's one aspect of this that comes into view, which is the father still has the rights to his daughter. And he can say, 
I don't want this lousy so-and-so being the husband of my daughter. And so therefore, you will not marry my daughter. And in that case, the man still has to pay that bride price as a penalty for what he has done. I should say as well, if he does marry her, he cannot divorce her either. So you see, there are consequences to an immoral conduct. Consequences to not honoring the marriage relationship. And in this particular situation, the young man bears responsibility for her. He must pay the bride price. He must marry the woman. And he can never divorce her. So if she, if, you know, after a while he discovers, boy, we really don't get along very well. Boy, I'm not happy with the way she does this and that. Too bad. You made that impulsive, rash, rash decision, and now you must live with the consequences of that. You must be married to her. The law of God is designed to protect the young woman so that if she is, she does have that relationship, she's protected from loss in either way, whether the husband stays with her or not, she is protected. Next, the, the law goes on to consider the sojourner who enters into the land. And you have here a situation which we have today with our apparently open borders, or porous borders at least, with many people coming into our country from abroad. And in, in Israel, you, you might have people coming into the country, and you were not to treat them harshly, but you were to be respectful of them kind to them, and take care of them. And so you could not take advantage of the stranger in your midst. They're not familiar with the laws. They're perhaps not familiar with the language. And so some unscrupulous soul could trap them, uh, deceive them, and uh, defraud them of their goods or what have you because they don't know all that's going on. And so the law is designed to protect the stranger in the midst of Israel to watch over them and to protect them. Now it seems to me that in our modern day, nations have something called citizenship and borders. And when somebody comes into the country, they have to come into the country legally, that's the law, and sign up with whoever is the authority involved and, and then come in and you are a stranger in the land in that case and you should be treated with respect cared for as though you were another citizen. It's a different matter, it seems to me, when somebody comes in breaking the law. At that point, they need to pay the penalty. They need to be escorted out of the country or what have you. To me, that is a different situation because you have laws in place that the sojourner needs to abide by. When they come into the country, they have to abide by the laws of the country. They can't steal. They can't uh, commit adultery. They can't uh, do this and that. They have to abide by the laws. That law also needs to be observed. Now, somebody who breaks the law still is treated with compassion and care, and but there needs to be a, a penalty as well that they're accountable for. So here is the, the issue with the stranger. The poor perhaps uh, need help with their finances, and they ask you for a loan. In this situation, while it is appropriate for you to charge interest on a loan as a business arrangement to somebody who is in business or uh, even just a family member, what have you, you can charge interest in those situations, but when you have somebody who's poor, who can't pay for their meal for that day, who doesn't have perhaps a place to stay or something like that, you're not to be charging them interest, you know, sky high interest too, as often happens, and, and then demanding that of them, not to take advantage of the poor in this way. You are to give them a loan freely, without interest. Indeed, in the New Testament, Jesus says, uh, give without expecting anything coming back to you. Not only to your friends, 
but to your enemies. Be gracious. Live a generous life. So there, there should be an openness to God's people, a readiness to help. But particularly for the poor within the church, we don't charge each other interest. We look out for each other and help each other. The specific situation is where it's appropriate to use collateral for a loan, and they would use once the poor man's cloak as a loan. Well, the poor man would sleep in that, and that would keep him warm at night. And so though it was appropriate to hold that cloak during the day, the, the uh, owner had to return that cloak back to the poor man so that he could sleep on it through the night. It cannot be harsh to this man to have him sleep out in the cold and shiver all night long because he didn't pay back his loan. God is compassionate for the poor, the weak, and the evil. So in these different circumstances, God takes care of his people. But this more, again, it is compassion. You, you see, furthermore, that if there is a situation where the stranger or the poor are abused, God hears from heaven. He hears the cry of distress. And he comes in his providence to bring judgments on those who take advantage of the poor, the stranger, the weak, and so forth. God watches out for those who are poor and needy. He has compassion on them. So the whole law was designed to protect them. Yes, give them a loan, but don't charge them interest. Don't make onerous uh, uh, demands upon them, which make life extremely difficult for them. Be compassionate in the way that you deal with your fellow man. God's law was compassionate and designed to protect people. Build them up. Give them a place where they can stand on their own. God calls us to freedom in Christ. And that freedom should be expressed in many different ways. So, there's that. And finally, the, the text brings us to a handful of requirements with regard to our worship of God. As we see God's justice at work, we have to be faithful in bringing before Him our offerings, our sacrifices, and so forth, so that we might commit ourselves to Him. Our uh, animals, the firstborn of the flock, was to be consecrated to the Lord. On the eighth day, it was to be given over to God. It anticipates the coming of Christ, who would come and be circumcised on the eighth day, and thereby consecrated to the Lord as the firstborn son. He is the one who is devoted to God. And he is the one who brings us justice and compassion. He is the one who obeyed the law for us. And in his compassion forgives us of our debts, sets us free from uh, all of our uh, obligations before God's law, and brings us into a place of peace, safety, and joy. So we are to be faithful to God, respond to his law with worship and praise, and yield our lives over to him. And then in conclusion, there's this one final note. We're probably going to save it for the next chapter, but uh, if somebody has an ox and is uh, eaten up by wild animals, uh, the law is you're not to take the remains of that ox and butcher it for yourself and eat it for yourself. Why? Because God's people are to be consecrated, set apart. They're to be holy. And under the old covenant, we had laws with regard to clean and unclean animals. And while the ox itself might have been clean, the animals that attacked it and killed it were not clean. And you're not to be touching any of that. And so that uh, food value of the ox was to be given to the dogs to feed them. So God takes care of the dogs. Provides for them and their needs. I give my dogs peanut butter and jelly, peanut butter sandwiches, so they're taking care of Every morning you get a peanut butter cream sandwich. Anyway, I bet not be happy. But God provides for us so that we are protected. We are protected from predators like the hawks that seek the rabbits and the squirrels and so forth of life, that live a humble life. God protects us, brings balance, brings justice, and also God is compassion.
compassion for us so that when we are weak, he is strong and our hand. When we are in trouble, he hears our cries of distress and he comes to our aid. This is the God whom we serve. And so we do not live as secularists in a naked, barren world without any hope of help from above. We have a compassionate God who sees and understands and actually helps bring us to the Father, we thank you for your love and care for us. We do pray that your spirit will bless your word to encourage our hearts and help us to draw near to you. Help us to appreciate the justice of your law and to live uh, to your glory and praise. We ask in Jesus' name.
closing hymn is 529, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, 529. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh.